All right, Hannah, we are live. All right. Okay, so I am so excited to present this webinar with a dear, dear friend and a brilliant colleague. So welcome to those who are tuning in. Thank you for joining us today. Well, the topic is very important, meaningful, and truly relevant. And we have a jam-packed session today. Um, the idea is how to structure our clinical practice and how to really uh, support uh, every child's development, every adult that we work with. So I wanted to start off with this uh, little uh, quote. Our society has so many critical problems that it desperately needs as many active participating internally minded members as possible. If feeling of external control, alienation and powerlessness continue to grow, we may be heading for a society of dropouts, each person sitting back and watching the world go by. What's so interesting about this quote, Hannah, that this may look like somebody, a, a, of course, a, a wonderful mind wrote this, but guess what? This was written by Julian Rotter in 1971. And one of the concerns that he was expressing based on his research about developing children and how their lack of sense of agency was really interfering them developing into full-blown adults. What's so magnificently shocking is uh, Jean Twenge uh, in 2017 says the allure of independence uh, uh, and so the as so powerful to previous generations holds less sway over today's teens. So what has happened in the last 50 years is somehow uh, as a society, uh, we have not empowered our children uh, to become more and more independent. In fact, they have gone in reverse direction. And the prediction that Julian Rotter made in 2000, I mean, 1971, almost um, is still holds true and even gotten worse. So with that in mind, COVID-19 situation is really stressful for all of us. I wanna frame it from this point of view that our generation before uh, COVID-19 hit us already was experiencing the challenge of raising independent minds. So with that in mind, um, we decided to, Hannah and I, so um, the goal here is to prepare our children for a lifelong journey full of challenges and excitement with skills that they very much need and optimism they need to harbor in their heart. So that's why this fantastic collaboration, I am here with Hannah Bogan Novak. She is a brilliant mind, a specialist in executive function and a co-founder of uh, a curriculum that you all should check out. At the end of this webinar, the last slide, we have um, a way to get in touch with her and we will be sending you a handout that will also uh, tell you a little bit more about her. So Hannah, welcome to the webinar. How are you doing? Thank you, I'm doing great. I am, I'm hiding, I have to admit, I'm hiding in my bedroom from my toddler, who I love dearly, but it, toddlers and webinars don't mix very well, so. <laughs> but if you hear banging, don't be alarmed, right? He's, everything's under control. <laughs> and, and actually, you handling your toddler while you're doing a webinar is indicative of your fabulously finessed executive yeah. There so you go. Cool with that. So I am going to, uh, the, the idea here is, um, thankfully we took the time to prepare. So we wanna bring some information that we both thought is pertinent and relevant. But uh, I really wanna see how can we give people concrete, direct and specific strategies. So my first question comes to you is, uh, what we know, uh, what do we know about the roles that regulation and brain integration play in the child's ability to be resilient and emotionally regulated during this difficult time? So I think that this is the perfect way to start any conversation about executive functioning because if we come to the table thinking about executive functioning, supporting these really critical skills for the students that we're um, working with, and we assume that we're going to start with getting them the right planner, getting them the right folder, putting the right schedule in place, and we don't actually, you know, build this foundation of solid regulation, we're missing the mark. Um, often I talk about executive functioning as an Oreo cookie. So if you're picturing an Oreo, you have two cookies with cream in the middle, those cookie outer layers are self-regulation. And strategic thinking is what lives in the middle. And in order to support self-regulation so you can get to all of the nitty gritty meat of executive functioning support, what we're really doing is helping this downstairs part of the brain. So, so the, the kind of feeling brain and the survival brain squished together feel calm and okay enough 
that the upstairs or thinking brain, the cortex can activate. And that is where executive functioning is really happening. It's, it's activation up in that cortical um, part of the upstairs brain. So the brain's job, of course, is to keep us alive. And if, if that downstairs brain feels overly threatened, then it is is going to actively shut down connection pathways to the thinking brain so that we're ready to react. Now, at a time where everybody is feeling somewhat dysregulated, right? I would say raise your hand if you feel dysregulated, but it's unnecessary because like, hello, <laughs> we're, we're all surviving a pandemic. Um, there, there's a lot more of that just low level, like amygdala activation going on. There's a lot more probably cortisol floating around in our systems. And the question to begin with is how do you help your students become their own amygdala whisperers, right? How do we tame these MIG moments or on the, the flip side, these sort of grabbing gulp reactions that they're feeling? Um, now, this isn't actually a talk to give a ton of strategies about regulation, though we could go down that pathway another time. But I would encourage everybody to, to be thinking about where is my student, whether that is a client you work with, whether that's your own child, right? Um, where are they in terms of their, you know, management of regulation? Are they in this river of well-being or are they on the banks of chaos or the banks of rigidity? Um, the way that we learn best, whether you are a child or an adult, is we learn best when we are in this green zone of regulation, okay? And, and often we, um, when we become dysregulated, you can go red, which is a little bit more of that stressed, anxious, overwhelmed mode. You can go blue, just kind of like alienated, disengaged, helpless. Um, some of us tend to go one way or the other. If you want to make a smart guess about which way I go, right? <laughs> the control freak type A. I go a little bit red. Um, but the, the first stop is getting out of that dysregulation, getting back to a place of brain integration between upstairs and downstairs. We want that downstairs brain being somewhat vigilant, right? It's our smoke detector, like what's going on? And we need to make sure the upstairs brain is able to, to loop in and say, I hear you downstairs. I got you. We can solve this. And then we engage executive functioning to make a plan or to identify a goal, make a plan and follow through. Um, so that's really, you no, know, that's really where we're starting in this whole process. Um, which brings me to a question that I want to ask of you. So, you know, kind of kind of bouncing off of this notion of regulation, how how should we be factoring in? in this under construction nature of the prefrontal cortex um, in young and developing brains and then set reasonable and meaningful expectations that are likely to lead to positive change in our clients and the families that we serve? Thank you for that question. And uh, first of all, just to um, uh, kind of second everything you have said about the upstairs and downstairs regulatory centers in the brain and, and lack of communication or enhanced communication is real key to demystifying uh, this dysregulated self. And to complement uh, your ideas, I thought I will also share uh, this one particular important um, understanding uh, that the prefrontal system is under construction for a long, long time. And what we know from uh, where we are in this uh, developing neuroscience research is that um, it may not even be completed until age 30. So now the predicament for all of us, those are, who are working from maybe kindergarten to um, 18, uh, these are developing brains. So they haven't reached their peak or maximized their own potential. But secondly, is the responsibility they're asked to serve are those responsibilities in sync with the brain maturation? And if not, then the second parameter we use that if you look at group of students and some are exhibiting proficiency at that age level and their peers are not, then that becomes the, the way to judge and evaluate competency. So keeping that in mind that all brains are under construction, but children with any developmental delay or challenges in learning have added burden of their delays being exaggerated. So second component I wanna talk about is the high performing brain versus the brain that's highly activated because of stress. So high performing brain is also doing a lot of work uh, and the brain that's under stress or toxic stress is also doing a lot of work. But the two brains that are doing this kind of work are not made the same. 
And I, I love uh, to kind of bring in this concept of um, uh, the neural cement or neural swamp that Bonnie uh, Bednock uses. Um, and, and the idea there is the, the optimal, what are the optimal learning conditions in which the developing brain can perform well in spite mm -hmm. of not fully being developed. And so then let's talk a little bit about the neural cement. The neural cement to me represents rigidity and in, incredible structure. So there are parents who themselves are anal retentive or teachers who are extremely organized, they're systematic, they're thoughtful, and they have a lot of rules. Now the problem with rules or the advantage of rules is expectations are clarified. But the disadvantage of, of, of the rigidity in the excessive rules is that rules cannot be bent and child who is not able to walk that thin line uh, of the rule fo following behaviors, they look like they, they are creating trouble for themselves. And, and, and often the, the parents or educators outlook towards that, those children is why are you not doing what I expect you to do? That's the neural cement. And the second part is the neural swamp. And that to me is chaos. Chaos of excessive permissiveness, either by the teacher or by the parents and even the therapist. And particularly we uh, as therapists have a little bit of a danger of becoming that because we are in a, take a role of support. We mm -hmm. often worry that by, by posing a little bit of a challenge, we may be taking away the opportunity for the child to learn. And so that swamp uh, is, is extreme looseness with which all information is coming to the child, child, child not having any discernment to begin with, to know what to pay attention to, what to ignore, what is important, what's not important, and what is of value for my future self versus what can be okay if I skip it. And, and so the, the idea is to create optimal conditions for functioning through two essential ingredients. One is stability, and second is flexibility. And to me, the stability comes from structure and consistency. And when there's structure and consistency, that is going to enhance that child's brain development in sync with the natural trajectory of development of executive function. And second is novelty and challenge. That means as you are presenting an opportunity for a child to adapt or think flexibly, if there is a challenge that's appropriate for the need and the skill level, then that can be of incredible value to that student. So what we wanna do is to create these two optimal con conditions, which to me is tilling of the soil. So I, I, in that sense, I feel that meaningful, and reasonable expectations need to be stated. And there needs to be some permission given to break the rules with, without any causing any defiance or that is not disrespectful. However, a child not paying attention, not looking, not doing everything being asked is not sign of lack of engagement. It is in fact in concurrent with the developing brain that is unable to sustain effort all the time on all things because they are not created equal. Yeah, yeah. So that brings me to uh, this uh, question for you, Hannah. Uh, what does promoting executive function skills look like right now with COVID in mind? So I, it's, this is such a wacky time. It's such a crazy time. Um, and for those of you tuning in who feel that your practice is really built around maybe specializing in executive functioning support, um, you may have had to take this step back and just, just go, what am I doing right now? Because the turmoil that, that families who may have actually been pretty put together, right? Like they had their systems, they had their routines, the parents were sort of, they were, they were good partners and coaches for their kids. A lot of that foundation that we've just been talking about may have been pulled away because there is so much change happening so quickly that being able to be flexible, adaptive, cohesive, right? Being able to, to sort of, to have a strong foundation that also can sway um, when the earth shakes is, is, is challenging for a lot of folks right now. So what I, I actually want my response to this to hopefully feel validating more than anything, um, that, that anything that we are doing as support people, whether you are doing this as a parent, as a therapist, as a friend, whatever you are doing to help the students in your lives um, begin to find a rhythm, a, a rhythm in 
in which they can move from survive to thrive, that is inherently building executive functioning skills. Because executive functioning is not just about, you know, this is my goal and these are the steps and these are the materials and here's the, you know, the way I'm gonna move through it. I'm gonna check it this time and this time. So often it's about being able to say, I just have to be a little more comfortable in an uncomfortable situation, right? It is the melding of regulation and strategic thinking. So I say this um, bearing in mind that every school, every district, every learning system that is out there um, is really going to look different. So what schools might be doing through Los Angeles Unified School District looks dramatically different right now than what Pasadena Unified School District is doing and what independent schools and progressive schools, some schools are handing out learning menus for families to choose from. Some schools are saying to families when it comes to, you know, looking through an academic lens, um, you know, here's a packet spend the next two weeks working on it as much as you want. Um, other kids are having really rigid schedules set up where teachers are providing you know, synchronous lessons that they're sitting over Zoom or something similar and they're watching at very set times. The landscape is, it varies dramatically. Um, so to say that there's one specific uh, a method that is, that is ideal for supporting executive functioning, I think would be unfair because so much of this is about adapting to the, the huge variety that's out there and meeting your students and your families where they are in this moment and acknowledging, am I moving them towards a rhythm? Am I moving out of the, I just got home with a brand new baby and I don't know what's going on into like, oh, I actually think I can predict when that baby is gonna fall asleep, right? That's what we're looking for right now. Um, for most families, home does not look like school. So even folks who have a, a history of homeschooling will say, and this is, you know, having been in conversations with a handful of veteran homeschoolers who also happen to be therapists, they've said, assuming that we've got this stuff on lockdown is unfair because you know, we're used to going to places. We're used to taking our kids. You want to talk about habitats, you go to the zoo, you explore habitats, right? You take your kids on a camping trip and you're going to talk about the different kinds of rocks while you're on a camping trip. And all of these opportunities have been curtailed for the moment. So, um, so tr you know, trying to take what was happening in school and suddenly recreate it at home is very challenging. Um, you think about some of the learning cues, those of you who work with kids who maybe have processing challenges, auditory processing or language processing delays um, or, or disorders, think of all the cues that they may have been tuning into in a classroom setting. Where is my teacher in the room, right? If my teacher is walking to the board with a, with a marker in her hand, does that mean something to me? If my teacher is walking to the door, does that mean something to me? We've lost a lot of those cues when we're now doing virtual learning. Um, you know, kids are, kids frequently glance at their peers to kind of go, oh wait, what channel are we supposed to be on right now? Like what brain channel am I meant to be on? And we've lost a lot of those cues when we're talking about virtual or distance learning. The ability to ask questions and get clarification in real time. These are the kinds of scaffolded supports that many of our students who struggle with executive functioning right now are missing. And a big question that you'll want to ask yourself as the, the sort of supportive individual in that child's life is, how am I helping my kids adapt and in many cases find compensatory strategies so that those needs that they have are still being met? And that may actually be working on the advocacy for a student to say, I need my Zoom lessons recorded so that my parent can sit down with me at a reasonable time and watch it with me and be able to help me answer questions that I can't possibly process in the moment as I'm listening to my teacher. Um, it may be, you know, t making use, sometimes teachers are doing virtual, uh, virtual like drop-in time or office hours that a student can go in and you as a support person are helping them come up with the kinds of questions that would, the powerful questions that they can ask to move them one step closer to their goals. Um, but, but the, you know, the big, the big driving force right now, in my opinion, when it comes to promoting executive functioning skills, so much of it is about ident helping a student identify what is my learning landscape? What, what is it? And where are the holes that I don't feel independent 
in, in filling in. And then we begin to fill in some of those holes. Um, so that's great. That's kind of where, where I've been directing folks right now. That's, I think that's really, really helpful. Um, I think because, uh, uh, as you said, I think the wisdom there is to be able to change because the circumstances have changed and change as you have new needs. So what I want to do, uh, uh, yeah, so well, I, yeah, so I, so, so, you know, moving forward, what I want to ask of you is, so as clinicians, because we're both clinicians, our goal is, um, is to see that our clients are using the strategies that we've helped them create, right? Not just that we're throwing them out there, but they're, they're really using them. So what is an effective way to actually get our clients to utilize some of these methods that we've personalized for them once we've figured out, oh, here's what I think is going to work? Yeah, thank you for that question. Because I was, as I was uh, listening to you, uh, I feel some of the uh, the old rules probably are out the window, and we have to kind of customize and tailor some of our responses. So, um, what I this is what I've been thinking about. That most important thing we need to remember that few things are as motivating as success, and success in, for a, particularly as a clinician, you and I work with people who struggle. And so what is that success for them? To me, it's not graduating from high school. It's not completing a course with an A. It's not, if, if somebody's struggling with auditory processing difficulty, what is the need of the day? And, and what is non-in-person learning for that child going to look like? If I, I'm working with a traumatic brain injury adult, what does that learning look like? So I want to kind of focus uh, that, frame that, the questions. And I came across uh, uh, or um, I love Doug, Doug Fisher and, and Nancy Frey's work. And there are seven steps to concretizing strategy use using this framework. And I thought we can walk through that um, uh, using an example. So uh, those who heard my podcast uh, webinar last time, I talked about 2510, uh, 2510 Pomodoro technique, uh, which is a modification. So I wanna walk people through applying uh, the concepts uh, from uh, uh, Ms., uh, for Dr. Fisher and, and Frey's work uh, to our work when we are individualizing the strategy use. Because ultimately to me, uh, two ways we can measure success during pan this pandemic is one, is the child leaving your session or your teaching or your class, class with greater self-awareness? And is the child has access to strategies that he or she knows how to revamp, uh, not just has strategy because we need to stop and have the child look back, is, has it worked? So this is how I see it. So let's start with the 2510 Pomodoro technique. Pomodoro is a tomato, and this was started using a tomato timer. It's a great technique. It's typically used for 25 minutes with five minute break, but I have modified in my practice to use this in this particular way. So I'm gonna walk you all through this technique. So first strategy is name the strategy. So when you're working with a, a child and you want them to develop independence and agency, I say to them that, okay, we are gonna practice 2510 strategy. This is a strategy um, and, and I kind of then start talking about the, the nature of the strategy. So step two here is to state the purpose. So I explain it this way that after working for 25 minutes, your brain needs to switch from task positive network to task negative network or to default mode network so that the brain, uh, brain's hippocampus can get a chance to connect all the information and solidify new learning into memories. And that letting the brain take a break allows that to happen. So once I explain the science behind it, I'm, I'm kind of indicating to the, to, to my, the uh, student I'm working with that there's some meaning and purpose to this approach. The, the next step that I, I take is explain when the strategies um, or the skill is used. When I have many tasks, projects uh, to get done and um, a very limited time, I use the Pomodoro 2510 strategy for myself to help me stay on track and use my time well. So I am now explaining when the skill is being going to be useful to me. So I am still in the demonstration mode. Then step four is to use an analogy. So, so there's something, if the strategy is too abstract, you can concretize and analogies and metaphors are so useful. So this is how I would say that I like to think of the strategy as making sure that I am removing all the ro roadblocks or rocks from the path of free time. So the ultimate motivator to me for a child, particularly teenagers and, and college students I work with, is I have no time, free time for myself. And the best way to create free time for yourself is to actually get the work done. 
And the best way to get the work done in the time you allocate is to be effective with the work that you, the time that you allocate. Uh, the next way and the, um, the last three strategies, uh, steps, so is to demonstrate how the skill, uh, a strategy or task is completed. So I am going to show you um, that I'm going to work on a worksheet myself. So first I'm going to skim the task to see what is needed to be done. And then I'm going to use my timer for three minutes followed by 30 second break. Now, this is really important. And in the virtual space, it's really important to show. Uh, I do a lot of screen share with my students and I show that how I'm using the break effectively through a screen uh, um, to the screen share. And I'll explain to you how I do that. Um, and, and so what I do is show the uh, worksheet that I'm going to work. So the student is going to see me do the worksheet. And then the break comes for 30 seconds. Then I show the Google timer. And then I am just chilling. I, I even have uh, bubbles for my younger kids to blow bubbles for 30 seconds. I mean, that's a little bit uh, too juvenile for my teenagers. But I do show that I, I, I love um, uh, origami. So I do origami and show them what I'm doing uh, in my, my free time. And, and it's a hobby of mine. And so I kind of share that. 30 seconds, that's it. And the timer goes off and then we get out of that uh, meta uh, or get out of that activity. And then now we start a discussion about the process. So the step six is to alert the learners about the errors to avoid, which is, hey, I have to be careful not to lose track of my timer as I take the 30 second break because I'm really enjoying the origami. So, and then the last step there is to assess the use of the skill, which is after you finish, um, you say to the student, now that uh, now I am going to see if my 2510 strategy actually worked or not. So it looks like I didn't stick to the plan as well as I thought. I let the timer go off after 30 seconds. And I just said to myself, let me just finish last two more folds. So uh, what I, I love about this uh, process is to, kind of demystifying and instead of being verbose and verbally charged, helping the students see the method in the madness by you being the recipient of that strategy. And that seems to be a really helpful way to illustrate your point, but also show that you too have difficulties, particularly in the step six when we discuss errors to avoid. Yep. And I, so, so I'm gonna talk in just a little bit about this notion of breaks it's, it's called breaks versus breaks um, because the, the break piece is just so it's like so many of our kids get stuck in the weeds. Like they're stuck in the muck over the breaks, right? They need the breaks. We need to make sure that they're getting breaks because otherwise for a lot of our kids, they really would just, I mean, it would take them so long that they would just be working way past the point that their brain fuel is depleted. So they absolutely need the breaks. And I also love the Pomodoro method. And I, I think it's super important to individualize it for kids. Um, well, um, but, oh, so go ahead. I think maybe you're going to answer this question. Uh, what is a, a, a um, or maybe what are functional strategies for parents and teachers and therapists and other supportive folks who are working with kids uh, uh, so they can use to support the executive function and regulation skills. And thank you. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but no, that's great. Maybe we can set up more detailed uh, explanation of some strategies you use. I'd love to. Yeah. And if you want, so, so you, you're lucky because you already have my visuals. If you want to throw them up while I'm talking about this, um, that might help some of our visual learners since that's often me. Um, because what I'm going to talk about is a little bit it's not complicated, but sometimes it's nice to just have the organization in your head. So the, the big strategy that I want to share with you is something that I call, um, or that's called stop and make a plan. And first and foremost, I'm going to stop and make sure that I give concept credit. The STOP acronym is um, really originated as far as I know from a brilliant speech language pathologist named Sarah Ward, who is an absolute specialist and expert in executive functioning. If you have not heard Sarah speak, um, sure. she is, she's incredible. She's a delight and she's definitely somebody who should be on your docket. And she, she has worked about, with, uh, at Mass General for eight years. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. She's, she's, she's fantastic. fantastic. And she talks about stop and read the room as a strategy for, um, for situational awareness. Now, as therapists, we know that we can often adapt and adjust strategies to be highly applicable in many different situations. And for kids who, especially your kids who have processing delays, 
finding strategies that are consistent and yet still adaptable is, is very key. So this one became adapted by um, a wonderful and brilliant educational therapist who I, I know and is a dear friend of mine. Um, her name is Carrie Lindemuth, and she's the co-creator of the Brain Talk curriculum with me. And she turns this into stop and make a plan for an ex for, through an executive functioning lens. And stop stands for space, time, objects, and people. So the questions that you're asking when it comes to something like getting work done, and especially in this era of distance learning. So we're thinking now about a student who's having to work at home or they're not used to working. We're talking about where are they trying to work? When are they trying to be um, effective and successful? What items and materials do they have available and who is there to help them learn? So as we move, you know, as we begin to move through this, let's talk about if something isn't working and we'll jump down to this first consideration, which is going to be the consideration for space. Um, so let's jump down a slide. And the question that we want to ask is, does the child's current learning space actually support focus, sustained attention, engagement, and creativity so that they can be successful. Now, it would be silly to say that there is one ideal way to set up a learning space. Some kids actually benefit from some ambient background noise when they're trying to focus. Some kids do not, right? Some kids need headphones. Some kids um, do a little bit better with music playing, but noise level is a consideration. Activity level. When you are supporting a student or perhaps you're doing consultative support, um, ask yourself or ask the parents, ideally, who's in and out of the space where the student is trying to work. Um, you know, another, another component of space that we want to think about is this idea of neural familiarity. Our brains get really good at getting really comfortable doing certain things in certain spaces. So for any of you who feel like you can never read in bed because the minute that you open the book, you fall asleep, that's, that's, that's a good example of this neural familiarity. Or if you have a hard time focusing on work when you're sitting in front in a room where there's a big TV in front of you, that's another good example. That certain spaces can activate these automatic kind of networks and, and, um, and reactions in us. And so if suddenly your student is trying to do work and focus in a space where they're used to playing, watching TV, um, you know, being outside, going to sleep, whatever it might be, that's a learning curve that their brain is having to adapt to. Now, brains are adaptive, we know this. Um, however, there might be a space that's more effective for them to be learning. So little adjustments can make a big difference. And look, if you're, if you're working with a student who says, I just want to be somewhere quiet and dark, and the best place for them to do that is like under the dining room table, then maybe they try working under the dining room table, right? Our job is to model this flexibility, adaptiveness, um, and, and cohesiveness so that we're helping them develop the best scenario for themselves. The next consideration is about time. And when we're talking about considerations for time, what we're doing is saying, when is, a child, when is this child's brain most available for learning? That, that may not be consistent with when that student's teacher is most available for running a synchronous Zoom lesson. So, you know, we'll have to take some of this with a grain of salt and acknowledge that we as therapists and, and their parents as parents are not necessarily in full control over every student's learning experience right now. However, um, you know, a child might be most available for the first, you know, maybe even during a meal, and then they need that break time set in. Um, something else to think about is, you know, the goal right now is not just that kids are focusing on academics and only learning and sort of only moving forward in their executive functioning capacities. There is also this big, important, you know, load of, of just spending time as a family and building positive social interaction, which, by the way, we know supports the development of executive functioning. So I say to families, if you find that all of that brain fuel has been blown in the morning, just trying to drag your, you know, your kids trying to drag themselves through learning. And then 
you're left with this frustrated, grumpy, you know, dysregulated child during all of the times that you want to spend together, that might actually be an indication that we need to flip flop some elements of the schedule so that the student is able to be sort of neurologically available for just that positive interaction. All right, considerations for objects. And I know we're flying through, but this is really just to give you a taste and you'll have access to all of these visuals. So your, the, the student's goal right now is not just to survive, but we are trying to shift into thrive. And I know that that might feel hard because it feels hard for most of us to thrive in, in, you know, in such an uncertain time. And yet there are things we can do that help us feel like we are doing more than just existing and getting through the expectations. So, you know, we start with an acknowledgement in that preview phase of setting kids up to be successful of what is it that you need in order to get through the task? And it might be a book, it might be paper, it might be a calculator, you know, whatever that the, the materials are. And then also what would actually help you feel a little more intrinsically motivated to get through this or extrinsically motivated, right? Do you need some cheddar rockets next to you? Or would, um, would some bubbly water, would putting a pillow behind a kid on a chair sometimes makes it feel so special. They get to sit in the spinny chair instead of the, you know, regular kid chair. Little shifts can help kids feel more like they're thriving. Um, what are the breaks? Articulate the breaks for kids. You know, do they need access to a focus tool, which I call a focus tool. Some of you are thinking, what's that? I call that a fidget toy. And my argument is if you call it a fidget toy and then you yell at a kid for playing with it, <laughs> that's on you. So do they need a focus tool? And I don't care if that's a binder clip that they're squishing in their hand, but something that helps them feel physically comfortable. Um, so, you know, you all know your clients better than I do, but those are considerations. And the final is about people. Um, the, the question that I would encourage people to be asking when it comes to who is the right person to be supporting kids through executive functioning or learning tasks is this notion of who becomes at home the homework master and who becomes the homework monster. <laughs> Sometimes certain parents are actually not best suited or certain caregivers are not the best suited for helping kids through certain tasks. And it's not just homework, yeah. but they themselves become dysregulated to the point that they're pulling their kids into the rigidity or the chaos. And somebody else who may not even be physically in that household, but it's still accessible, may be the best person to fill in and be supportive. Um, so a lot of things to think about. Uh, I did, I promised that I would talk about breaks versus breaks. Um, which, which is this consideration of, you know, are we helping kids identify things that are truly functional and fulfilling breaks, pauses in work, or are they doing something that is, that is putting the brakes on learning? Um, many of our kids with executive functioning challenges will say things like, I'm just going to go do that one level of that game that I was playing before. And the problem is that that level actually takes 25 minutes to get through. And they don't have a 25 minute break. So when we interrupt the level that they're trying to get through to re-engage them into whatever the task is, they feel like they're being cheated out of their break, right? Yeah. And suddenly it's become more dysregulating than it was to begin with. So I would, I always encourage folks to make what we call a break menu and say, what's a five minute break look like? You know, what are three or five or 10 different five minute breaks? What are a few different 10 minute breaks? What are some 20 minute breaks so that they know that they can choose from that menu when we're allotting certain amounts of time for breaks. And my final thought on strategies is something that I call the power of and, um, which is really about validation. Remember at the beginning, I said, sometimes support the best way that we support executive functioning is about helping kids begin to learn to be a little more comfortable in an uncomfortable situation. And if we, if we attempt validation by saying something like, I can see that this is so frustrating for you, but it doesn't really matter what you say next, because what that brain is going to hear is you, I don't care, or you shouldn't feel this way. That, but becomes this really powerful invalidating, um, you know, can like little joiner. So just shift it to and 
seemingly in, in Congress ideas can exist in balance, right? I see that you feel really frustrated. I hear you telling me that you don't want to do this right now. And I appreciate that this is hard and we're going to do at least two of them, right? Or we're going to work for uh, until the timer ends. I feel so proud that you are trying your best. I'm here to support you. We meet the downstairs brain. You are safe. That meets survival brain. I am with you. That meets emotional brain. And we can solve this together. That meets thinking brain, right? Yeah. We never want to just jump to problem solving with our kids because we missed that critical foundation of regulation, but we can get there. We can get to the problem solving. And so much of it is this power of and. Um, and that, that brings me to my final question for you, which is how can we actually apply the findings from positive psychology, um, which is so important for us in the field that we're working in, um, to create an optimal social emotional, to create the optimal social emotional conditions that facilitate learning and adaptive problem solving and this sense of emotional calm for our students? Well, I think it's so funny that you mentioned your previous strategy, which is completely aligned with the positive psychology message, but it also reminds me of Tina Fey's uh, uh, experience from uh, improv comedy, how she learned uh, to uh, learn the power of yes and. Yep. <laughs> and I, so well, I, yeah, often, right? I often use improv exercises with my kids who tend more towards the banks of rigidity. We, I have... Um, so I have a bunch of the imp like how to improv books and I actually worked with a wonderful speech therapist back when I lived in Oakland who adapted one of those, um, a whole series of improv exercises for kids who have social communication and social regulation and executive functioning challenges. I mean, can you, I mean, it, that's a whole, again, we have so many webinar ideas. You and I, we're, we'll do this again, but there's, again. there's so yeah, well, much that I, comes out of the improv world. Yes. So, uh, uh, what I, I was also thinking, the reason I, I felt this question was really helpful uh, for our listeners and audience and my personal practice is mm -hmm. this sense of, uh, we started with uh, uh, Rotter's research and Gene Twenge, that one of the biggest things that is missing in children's life is sense of agency and the sense of control that they need to feel. So one thing to remember as people need a sense of control over their lives, without it, they become stressed angry, uncooperative, and hostile. And it is not the other way. Stressed people lose sense of control, which is often how we perceive because we feel a child is, um, a child is anxious and is losing control over, your, over their lives. But the inner truth is that they are not feeling empowered enough to have any sense of control over their lives. So the, the, uh, the most important thing, I think, the best message to convey to children in these difficult times is that this is your life we respect that and we support that. And that's such a beautiful language there that we respect that it is not me who wants you to see you succeed. I'll be happy if you are, uh, but because you wish to see yourself success and thank you for recruiting me or thank you for inviting me to join your life's journey so I can be of help, but this is your life. Secondly, that we support that has a very important psychological makeup to it. Um, so the, the idea there is to become the anchor that, uh, for the ch uh, child's inner well-being. And it has two, two important aspects to it. One is to build close nurturing relationships with the children that we work with. And particularly even uh, uh, since uh, children are at home and parents are having to parent, what is the nurturing relationship versus a parent who is a dictatorial or parents who's trying to craft success by doing a lot for the child. So uh, a good recommendation that uh, William uh, Sticksrud gives is to become a consultant. Uh, I, I call it parent touring, uh, which is a parent mentoring idea. And, and second is to champion for the child. So one of the important things about the champion is to actually stand on the sideline and cheer not run the race for the child. And it's very tempting to sit down next to the child and saying that, okay, you dictate the answer, I'll type it, you, come on, let's do this together. I think that doing this together is, has a good intention, but the execution is poor. And what we are learning from positive psychology is that is not a true way to support a child's sense of agency. 
The next idea to think about is this example that uh, I recently um, watched this wonderful documentary uh, and James Baldwin there uh, talks fondly about his teacher, Bill M uh, Miller. And he says that she gave me books to read, talked to me about the books and, and about the world. And she took me to see plays, films, and, and uh, which that no one else would have dreamed of taking a 10 year old boy. I think what's so powerful here is the relationship that he felt and he wrote about it later on in his book in 1978 as a full grown adult looking back at what were the markers where his life took a different turn. And so we have an opportunity to become something called a charismatic adult uh, for the, the, the child. Uh, the, and, and so that is a, a um, again, uh, researchers talk about this, a non-anxious presence. And I love this idea of a non-anxious presence because what is that non-anxious presence conveying? You are conveying your belief system, your attitude, and your own emotional regulation by being a non-anxious presence. You can tell, a child can tell, because emotions are, uh, there's something called emotional contagion that is just like infection, emotions can be caught on. So a child can actually feel the sense of anxiety that the mother or father feels. A child can feel extremely defeated if, this, uh, if uh, you can sense the parent next, standing next to the child is feeling a sense of frustration or disappointment that you're still not getting this math, what's wrong with you? Or the, uh, or the teacher's disappointment that, you know, I'm dealing with 17 kids uh, in distance learning and somehow you're needing more instructions. Impatience to me is certainly not conveying a non-anxious uh, a presence. So in order to guide uh, a child better during these times, I think the three other things you can do is demystify the learning challenge by explaining why that aspect of learning is difficult. If you have a child with ADHD, explain what ADHD does to executive function. If you have a dyslexic child, explain what dyslexia on the brain looks like. Third is to bring clarity around issues that the child is facing. And the clarity about issues is learning is not only hard for children with difficulties, but learning is hard for everybody. And definition of learning is not knowing. So not knowing means not knowing related anxiety. And the last is provide hope. So my, my message here is a non-anxious presence comes from this sentiment that calm is contagious. And because you're calm, you're allowing that lower level brain that you were talking about in the introduction to come to a sense of equilibrium. So as uh, we um, conclude here, or this, was, this was my me takeaway message for people that one is it's a spiritualized way of supporting and and spiritualizing is fully being there without being invested in the outcomes of the or the mm -hmm. results of the child's mm -hmm. behavior that means i am not the maker of your destiny but you are and i am so glad to be part, part of your life i'm grateful for this opportunity and i'm thankful for you consulting me but i ain't doing it and and so i will share this slide but there is a a few kind of tips in terms of the communication cues that you can use is defining the goals for therapy, not just for global sessions, but individual session. And I do exit interview with my clients and I'm so mm -hmm. proud to share one quick story about a client that I saw um, uh, last week is a very difficult client of mine and it's impossible to get an A from him. So I always ask three questions. Did, we, did I help you to achieve the goals you had for you? Two, did I do, do well? Was I supportive of you? And three, did you do well? Did you do all, all the things I asked? And this report card we use as a way to discuss next week's session. And that I find extremely helpful. So I recommend people to do that. Second is that. To, uh, to ask the question such as, show me how you have helped yourself and show me why it didn't work. So rather than running and rescuing the child, the child is asked to explain their breakdown in their own words, which also does two things. One, it gives you a window into what they were thinking. And second, it gives you the process that didn't work so you can finesse from there. Imagine the worst thing you can do for a child is to provide a strategy that they feel they have already tried. That's not a good place to be. Third idea is to, if the, if the kid is doing well, be generous. Be generous with your support, with your love, with your appreciation, but do not praise results. Praise the effort. And so the language there is you must be so proud to see yourself do well. And I really love the way you worked hard on it. I think, again, um, you know, it's so funny that uh, the, before the positive psychology became positive psychology, there was a, something called self, a self, um, 
uh, not self appreciation, but but kind of a, a self esteem movement and self esteem movement was really anchored in this idea that making children have a high sense of self. Then what happened? These arrogant <laughs> children who thought right. highly of themselves incompetent, right? And so but the it, last uh, so. Uh, yeah. so so the last thing I was going to say is if the child is being unwilling or uncooperative, the, use the psychology of, of you know, research from positive psychology and say to the child, what do you think I'm feeling about your cooperation here? And tell me, why do you think I feel that way? Mm -hmm. And kind of getting their attention back. So I don't know, Hannah, before we do the summary of our findings, do you have any thoughts or you want to share? Well, about? I, I, I just want to, I, I just want to emphasize. I mean, I think that, I think this is like the cornerstone of, of what we've talked about today that you brought in at the end. Um, and so I, I just want to emphasize it because I fully agree. Um, you know, Tina, Tina Payne Bryson and Dan Siegel, who co-author a handful of books, their newest book is called The Power of Showing Up. And, um, and I'm the director of speech and language at Tina's practice in Pasadena. And so we talk a lot about this lens of interpersonal neurobiology, which is, you know, shares a, so much of what you've been sharing and everything is rooted in the relationship. Like if, if we don't have a relationship with these kids, then it doesn't matter what kind of brilliant ideas we have to share, right? They're not, they're not ready for it. And we also know, you know, what it's, it's what you were saying at the beginning or a few slides, a few slides back in answering this question, like they need one person, like one person. If you have one strong attachment figure in your life, your outcomes, your long-term outcomes are so significantly improved. And it doesn't have to be a parent. It can be a coach. It can be a therapist. It can be a friend, but one strong attachment figure. So if we know that one can be life-altering, imagine the neural, you know, connectivity and flourishing that can happen if you have lots, right? If we're just one of many. Um, so I love, I actually hadn't thought about this idea of spiritualizing support before, um, but I think that this is just awesome. I think it's just awesome. And I think if folks want more that book, The Power of Showing Up is a great way. It's a great place to even guide parents because it's so parent friendly um, to reinforce this notion that, you know, I'm here doing this. What could it look like as a parent for you to do this too? Fantastic. Well, I can't believe it is already that time for us to kind of summarize our findings. Uh, thank you, Hannah. Um, what I was thinking since we have last seven to eight minutes, I will um, kind of say um, my thought and your thought. If we have that kind of time, let's just whiz through it. I'll say something, you say something. So the first slide here uh, is cultivate close nurturing relationship with your children uh, that you help. And this cultivating, uh, the, the steps to cultivating a nurturing relationship is to know them. And one of the most amazing signs I feel you know them is to know something about them that, that they don't know you know. And I take a great uh, effort to kind of, uh, one of the best ways to do that, by the way, is to remember histories with your clients. So mm -hmm. if in March, a, a client of mine told me something about he did or he watched and how much he loved, and, and then I texted him a, a, another clip I found that was very similar, he was bowled over. He said, you remember that? And I said, I've been following that. I have been following these two humorists or cartoonists, and yep. I don't understand that humor that well. Um, I, I have a, a adult um, ASD client and uh, with Asperger's, and and he loves uh, animes, and he introduced me to certain part of subculture of anime, and I take the time to kind of see some of the newest clips that get uploaded, and I yep. share with him, and he that has brought us very close because he knows I care about him. Yeah. So I don't know what your thoughts are about this idea about, or anything you want to say, or we can move. Yeah, I, uh, so, so I've often done, talked about this when I work with teachers, when I do trainings with teachers, I say, um, you know, as a, a great goal to have is learn at least one thing about each of your students that has nothing to do with who they are as a learner, but everything to do with who they are as just a kid, right? As a person. So, um, you know, and it, and just like what you said, if it's something where you don't share an interest, then, then share a curiosity. Like you don't have to love everything that your kids love. And frankly, kids see through that. 
So if anything, it's okay to say like, I don't really know. I don't think I get this at all. Why is this so funny? Does everybody think this is funny your age? Like it's okay to have that banter. And then like you said, follow up. Okay, I found one that I think is like this. Is this right? And it also lets kids be the expert in something. Like you're, you're showing up in their lives as an expert. And I think it's great to show them that they have an expertise that they bring to the table. Um, and, and frankly, like we're moving them towards, we want them to be experts in themselves. So this is a way I think to give them that opportunity to show that they have an expertise in themselves. So the next idea is move the reactive brain to the receptive one. And we talked about, I think two factors that come to my mind is emotional contagion. Your mm -hmm. sense of emotional well-being is reflected through your attitude, not through your words. Don't, so don't say, I'm calm, I'm fine. And none of the, <laughs> nothing about you is exuding calm. So um, the, the best way to get the, the inflammation on the brain to go down and, and to kind of walking in, uh, through this uh, open doors into the prairie is to really be less reactive yourselves. Yeah. Uh, and, and as a clinician, I think one of the clinicians sent me a, te a text with a question that how can I keep a check on my own emotions when I'm dealing with a lot of things while I'm dealing with this kid who has a lot of difficulties. And I really feel about this particular aspect is, I think where's your sense of hope for this child? I think we are too excessively informed about the truth. <laughs> I think people like you and I who have experience with disabilities, we somehow some, somehow have too much window into bad effects if these things don't improve. And I always remind myself of all the things. Uh, on my desktop, there's a woman, uh, I have a, a story of a woman who at age 40, 56 started climbing the Empire State Building stairs. Yeah. And eventually at 60, after four years, she climbed uh, Mount Everest. Wow. It just tells me that anybody and everybody can take on a challenge that they were not prepared for and change. So if I don't have that belief system, I cannot uh, contribute to yeah. the reactive brain to become yeah. a good one. <laughs> yeah. And put on your own oxygen mask first. It is actually okay. You certainly have my permission to just, if, if you're feeling dysregulated and you have a kid who's dysregulated, model what regulation looks like. Because you know what we call that? We call that co-regulation, which is really important. Model what it looks like. Do it out loud. Um, because eventually that becomes the narrative that your kids that you work with are adopting and internalizing. So if all else fails, just talk about yourself. And that's okay. It's okay. Yes. And, and the next thing that you mentioned about ensuring the success of STOP method, I think uh, I have found that anytime you're introducing a, a complex strategy, which has multiple components, yeah. I like to meta that strategy. That means I get the students, I create cue cards, I write the strategy, then I create the, use the acronym, I do a quiz before even using the strategy. So that, yeah. that the strategic knowledge without the actual experience is complete and cohesive. And yeah. I find that to be very effective as well. Yep. I'm with you. So the next one is, you talked about this, think of breaks versus breaks. So I love that actually. And, and one thing that ab about the breaks that are interruptive, uh, the next tier to me is kind of observing and keeping a catalog of breaks. I have uh, actually worked with uh, clients and created two columns of breaks versus breaks, but not uh, listed that they thought, but by their parents providing over observations from last five days. Yeah. So now what we have is some information or data so the kids can't like just saying, oh, I'll do this when I have a break or uh, I don't do that to break my concentration or break my workflow. So that data can really help the students to come have a buy-in so that they say, oh, I do that. Um, so that can be very helpful as well. By the way, did you put a picture of this puppy on here? Because that would immediately put the brakes on learning and you would um, have to play with this puppy forever because that's, that is exactly what I would do. <laughs> I recently attended a, a neurobiology of stress a webinar, and it was so funny. And they talk about talked about canine therapy and having just a dog can act as a de accelerating your uh, emotional distress, I guess. And so I thought this can be a double edged sword. So if the child is finding the work to be too intense, they take a puppy break. The puppy break can derail their work further, but calm them down. So it's it's a give and take. True. True. And the good news is puppies don't stay puppies. <laughs> That's also very true. 
<laughs> and so we talked about the uh, know the power of and. Yes. and I would add that yes and. So say yep. yes to them yep. and then follow that with and, uh, which is a great strategy. And help families find uh, a rhythm and schedule and system that works. And I love what you said that uh, these are individualized and tailored and to be experimented with. I yeah. think be courageous to play with and throw something that doesn't work. Don't feel that, oh my God, everybody recommends this strategy. In my family, it's always chaos. Well, don't do something else. Be open right. to bringing your own rhythm. You can have your own playlist. I yep. love that. <laughs> and, um, and so that cultivating non-anxious presence within yourself and having some kind of a self-check. Last webinar that I did, I talked about the home spa concept, creating a spa where you just take a time out and you put a sign there, please do not disturb, we'll be back after 30 minutes or whatever the sign is indicating that I'm not able to be that non-anxious presence right now, <laughs> I need a break. <laughs> right, right. And, and re, uh, readjust the filter, right? And yep. so the last thing that I want to say is as we end, let your child know and feel that he is in charge of their own destiny. And, and Hannah, I cannot thank you for being a fantastic partner. I can't wait to do something more and dive deep into so many things that you brought up. And, and uh, you're, you're wonderful, you're kind and thoughtful and so generous with your time and, and helping uh, our participants gain uh, ideas and knowledge. Uh, I thank you so much. It was my pleasure. Thank you for including me. This was a lot of fun. And we'll, we'll definitely have to, we'll be back. <laughs> we will be back. And, and guys, uh, this is, uh, uh, oh, uh, well, this is not the right uh, slide, but I have Hannah's information in the slide that's coming your way. Thank you for joining us today and have a fantastic uh, rest of the week. And please have all the success, all the power to you as you help every person in need. So thank you very much. Yes. Bye. And meeting?